Glory to Jesus Christ, your prayers are asked for Joan Pugh, who uh, left this mortal life yesterday on the Feast of the Assumption. And uh, no, she was very devoted to Our Lady and uh, to Jesus Christ as a Lord and Savior. So your prayers are asked for her. Eternal rest grant to Joan, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon her. May her soul and the souls of all the faithful departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. Glory to Jesus Christ. So we're on our spiritual book club reading Father Jacques Philippe, Fire and Light, Learning to Receive the Gift of God, published by Scepter Press, copyright 2016. Father Jacques Philippe was born in 1947. I thought you'd like to know that. He's French. He's a member of the community of the Beatitudes, founded in France in 1973. After studying in Nazareth, Jerusalem, and Rome, he was ordained a priest in 1985. He primarily devotes himself to spiritual direction and preaching retreats internationally. And his published books on spirituality are the consolidated result of such work. His books, Real Mercy, Interior Freedom, and Thirsting for Prayer, among others, are also available from Scepter, Scepter Press. You can find out more about Father Philippe and his preaching schedule at FR Jacques, capital J A C Q U E S, Philippe, capital P A, capital P. H I L I P P E dot com. And uh, the Scepter Press uh, can be found at info at Scepter Publishers uh, dot org or www Scepter Publishers dot org with the phone number two one two three five four. 0670. So that's enough for the commercial. And let's pray our in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Ask that the Holy Spirit lead us in reading this and in growing more deeply into openness to receiving the Holy Spirit, receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, receiving the Father as our own Father. The prayer to the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who instructed the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that by the gift of the same spirit we may be always truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And following... Our class today at 3.30, we'll have a mass on Facebook for the uh, eternal rest of Joan Pugh and for the uh, Lord's blessing on her husband, Gordon, her children and grandchildren. And so that it'll be preceded, that will be at 3.30, 3.30 Eastern Standard Time, and it will be preceded by mid-afternoon prayer for the deceased. And we are in Fire and Light by Father Jacques Philippe on the bottom of page 13 on obedience as part of spiritual receptivity. Number four, obedience. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. The Acts of the Apostles says in Acts of the Apostles 5, 32. 
It is clear that the more we desire to do God's will, the more we receive the grace to do it. So there, there's no such thing as irresistible grace. There's the, no, it's, we're not going to be forced into doing God's will uh, 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 for us, his, the, uh, the uh, providence for our lives. We will not be forced into that. We will not be forced to love God back. But, of course, that's the only tragedy that there is. Every other tragedy will be healed. But that tragedy, if we choose to evict God from our lives and continue in that choice even to death and beyond, that's the only real tragedy. God gives his spirit to those who are resolute in obeying him. We have to remember, as St. Paul said, there's the obedience of faith. But without the commitment to obedience, our faith, is at best weak, if not dead. God refuses nothing to those who refuse him nothing. I think that's uh, from Teresa of Avila. This obedience, which of course must not come from fear, but be inspired by trust and love, is therefore an important form of spiritual receptivity, unless the fear is the, the Timor Dei, the fear of the Lord, the respect, the awe, the uh, uh, the honoring of God uh, in that, which involves commitment, of course. Uh, that's one of the, the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But fear in the sense of, uh, I'm just going to do this because I don't want to be punished. Or I'm going to do this just because I don't want to go to hell. Now that's not a bad place to start, but it's not a good place to end. It's to be love, to be doing these things out of love, to be uh, not doing things out of love. That everything is motivated by love, inspired by love, inspired by grace, uh, empowered by grace. This obedience, which of course must not come from fear, but be inspired by truth, by trust and love, is therefore an important form of spiritual receptivity. Because you know we're not earning this, we're not forcing this on God, we're not pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps. We're being receptive to grace. We're being cooperative with grace. We're yielding to grace. We're going along with the flow of God's grace and working with the flow. And we're going against the current of the world, the flesh, and the devil. And that can only be done, not only successfully, but done at all, by God's grace. It can come in different forms, obedience to the word, to our superiors in the church, to, our, to legitimate human authority. So you know, if you're young, your parents, in work situations, to your boss, he's paying you after all, and uh, things like that. But of course, obedience, all obediences, all human obediences, must be subjected to divine obedience. This, there are priorities in obedience. There's a hierarchy of obediences. There's uh, doing things to uh, make things run smoothly. To, when a, a, a confrere, uh, a, a colleague tells you, asks you to do something and you do it, you're not, often, you're not bound unless it's an area of, uh, you know, this is coming from, from the, the boss or something like that. Uh, we're not bound to that. But often in charity we do this, often we do this for the sake of harmony, uh, we do this out of respect for that person. But we don't have that obedience vow. You know, it's, you know if someone in the rectory asked me to do something, I will try to do it if I'm able to do it, and uh, but I'm not bound in obedience to do that. The way I would be if the, if the bishop asked something, so uh, you know I may question this, but if the bishop says no, do it, then I'll do it. Unless, of course, it's contrary to uh, the law and grace of God. So you know, if let's say I lived 500 years ago with the bishop. Uh, ordered me to uh, spy on heretics and denounce them and uh, 
so that they could be punished. Hello? Come in. Hi there, I'm on the... Uh, on my Sorry. Thing. That's okay. I wanted you to meet this, this couple, but you could but you can't meet that. I really can't, but uh, hi there. If they want to come by, I'll just wait. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. Yeah, this, this wedding couple that uh, Father Hickey prepared, but he can't do the wedding now, and I'm he's going to meet them. All right. So. What is He's Portuguese, Brazilian. Oh, Zuwal. we call them. John. Yeah. Okay, and, hi. And Nicole. Hi. This is Father O'Driscoll. Hi there. Do you want to be on Facebook? <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a class. I'm teaching a class oh, now nice. on Facebook. Jim, thanks for interrupting the class. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. These Thank are lovely you. people. Lovely could, people. Hi there. Could I invite you the, the day before, which would be the Friday, we could do the rehearsal together so that they can see you a bit. Okay, okay. And it is a ceremony. Okay, good. Okay? We told them. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Boatage. Okay. Back to this. Okay. This life goes on, you know. So, um, where were we? Obedience. So, uh, you know, so, uh, of the, so there's the hierarchy of obediences. So if, let's say I was, you know, in Spain and, and uh, 500 years ago, and they said, well, but we want you to denounce uh, conversos and, and spy on them to see if they're, you know, not really Catholic or something like that. I would actually be in conscience be obliged to disobey uh, such a thing. Or if a bishop, you know, told me to go along with the Nazis or something of some, some, or something like that, I would be obliged to disobey, however passively. But uh, that would be because there's the higher obedience. It is better to obey God than men. So that, but, uh, but uh, we should usually give the superiors the benefit of the doubt in such such things. But when it is no doubt, when it's obviously uh, evil or wicked or or uh, uh, destructive, then we're not going to go along with it. So it comes in different forms: obedience to the word. So uh, where, uh, scripture in tradition in the church tells us something. There are com we, when you think of commandments, we think of the Ten Commandments from the Old Testament. But uh, uh, Jewish tradition has found six hundred and thirteen commandments in the the Bible. Some big, you know, you shall not murder, and some small, you shall not eat uh, pork or something like that. Uh, but of course, we're in the New Testament, so we're not. Uh, subject to uh, the works of the law, so to speak. Uh, there are plenty of works of the law that are good, and you're free to do them if you like. You know, you're, free, you're free to become a vegetarian or whatever. It's, it's, it's up if you to do it for the glory of God. Sure, go ahead. Uh, but we're not obliged. We're not obliged to keep the, the Saturday Shabbat as Gentiles and the like. So, uh, But we there are commandments in the New Testament, such as, uh, do not absent yourself from the church, from Hebrews. That's a commandment, and so uh, the, the it's underlined in the precept, one of the precepts of the church. It was especially to worship on the Lord's day, on uh, Sunday, the day of the resurrection, and especially the highest form of you, you worship, the Eucharist, being in that. So there were all these commandments that are part of the the way the life of grace. That are part of the uh, the commandments of the new law, so we have that, and the the moral commandments, the true moral commandments of the old law, are not abolished; they're intensified. So uh, they're not just they're not works of the law; they're works of grace. So that's intensified. So uh, our roots are very much in the Old Testament, in the. Uh, Mosaic tradition and the, the Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew re revelation, uh, and so, uh, uh, but it's all in the light of Christ. It's all under God is love and Jesus is Lord. So we get that. So it's a legitimate. So we're called to obedience to legitimate human authority. We're, we're called respect to them. So you're crossing guards, you know, as a child, all this stuff. Uh, uh, when you go into a shop, 
to, to show respect and obedience to the the uh, adults there, the, the people in positions of responsibility. And so we are in, in society according to our age, according to everything, according to various other things. Uh, that's, uh, for society to be ordered, there has to be obedience to the law. Unless, of course, as I mentioned before, the law is wicked, or the law, uh, the law is evil, so we're obliged to go against it. To take, for example, uh, following the Dred Scott decision and all the pro-slavery laws, you're, uh, we were obliged, which many people avoided, uh, even people who realized that they were obliged, uh, avoided, uh, obliged to defy that law in any way that we can. So uh, am I under the obligation to defy a lot of the point of being punished for it? Well, it depends on what the, the, the evil is on that. So if, but let's, you know, paying taxes that are going to go to evil things, am I obliged to uh, do that even if I'm going to be imprisoned or even executed uh, for such a thing? Well, I'll leave that up to the moral theologians to talk about that. But, uh, but we are actually obliged to avoid paying things according to the process of the law. So if, you know, let's say you know paying taxes that you know are going to go for abortions, that are going to go for immoral things, or go to murderous purposes, uh, we have the obligation to do that, but through the process of the law, uh, to do that as the law states. You know to take uh, 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 you know filling out your tax form, to take all of the legal uh, things to uh, mitigate your taxes, to lessen your taxes, uh, are the legal, the legal ways. Again, the emphasis on the legal in that. So you're uh, more or less obliged to that. But uh, are you obliged to risk property or even life uh, for such things? There are people, uh, heroic virtue, are we uh, compelled to act in heroic virtue in all circumstances. Well, let's say I'll let that, that's a complicated uh, a thing to dis discuss uh, and we don't have time for that now, but uh, maybe we will. When we do the catechism, when we get to that part of the 5,000 page catechism, when we get to the uh, part on the commandments, and, uh, then we'll get into that more. So, it is also expressed by submission to one another in love. So you 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 submit like a, a married couple that they submit to each other in love. They're not lorded over the way the Gentiles do, or stuff like that. No, it's supposed to be uh, submission and love to each other, but in love. It's in love with Christ as the center. Okay, so you don't obey your spouse. Uh, if the person is, is advocating doing something that you know is wrong, uh, morally wrong, that is, or, or detrimental to the children, to you, or to the spouse. Submission to one another in love, something that Paul insisted on so much. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ, with Christ as the center, directed by the Holy Spirit there. Ephesians 5, 21. Each time we renounce our own will, freely and out of love for someone, we open ourselves to the grace of the Holy Spirit. So uh, the more we cooperate with grace, the more grace there is to cooperate with. You know, of course, well, there's an infinite flood of grace, but the issue is our receptivity to it, our open to it, openness to it. You can bring a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. You can bring a person to grace, but you can't make him drink. So we have to cooperate. It has to be willing. It has to be love, uh, willing. So, and of course, we start. We don't always start off with the best of motives. As we mentioned, fear may be the beginning thing. That you do what is right, not because it's right, but because you're afraid of being punished. And then you do what is right not because it's right, but because you'll be rewarded with it, for, that it's of some 
material or emotional or some other or social benefit to you. But then the the mature response is you do what is right because it is right. And then even beyond that, you do what is right because it is loving. And of course, we do what is right because it is loving needs to be done in a loving way, which is in all ways a, um, the nicest way isn't always the best way of applying love. But the loving way is the only way for a Christian to apply anything. So, and of course, some people rationalize and they say, I'm doing this out of love, even though it hurts, when often it's, uh, the motives are very, very mixed. And uh, often love has little or nothing to do with it. Sometimes there's hate uh, there disguised as love. You just take, you know, people, uh, you know, you go online and some people attacking uh, Catholics and they say, oh, well, you know, we, we have a burden for Catholics. We want to share the gospel with Catholics. The gospel often is the last thing they want to share with us. The good news of Christ, God is love, all that. No, it's, it's some uh, aspect of, let's say, fundamentalist Protestant uh, theology uh, that they insist is uh, absolutely essential to salvation, uh, even though they say it's not by works. To, to, uh, uh, they demand that you practice the work of leaving Catholic Church and believing what they believe. Um, so it's, anyway, so you see, and often you, you, you don't need to be uh, greatly endowed with psychic uh, psychic powers or even great uh, uh, perception to see right through the veneer of, oh, we love you, to see that uh, the hatred that's there by these people. And not just hatred for the church as they conceive it. And as Bishop Sheen said, there are millions of people who hate what they think the Catholic Church is, but there are only hundreds who hate what the Catholic Church actually is. Although I would say now, uh, Sometimes it's a lot more than hundreds, yeah, especially now with uh, the, the immoralities that were condemned 70 years ago are now applauded uh, as we said, and, and pushed, you know, abortion, all this stuff, that, all these, these things that are rightly condemned by the church, and then they reject the church for teaching what the church actually teaches in some cases, in these cases, and hate us for that, and uh, wish to uh, destroy the church, and not infrequently wish to destroy us in some way or other, punish us in somehow or other, or at least uh, uh, stop us from being Catholic, at least publicly. So uh, that exists. And sadly, there are Catholic people who are the same. And the other way, you know, the, 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 this fanaticism, but often these people are post-Catholic, really. They're in... Uh, some uh, Feniite schismatic group or their Feniite fellow travelers uh, who are you know, denouncing heresies but while themselves embracing heresies of this and, and lacking love. And, and uh, if, if you want to be an evangelist, and stuff, if you lack love, do everyone a favor and just stay away from that. Don't even consider, quote unquote, sharing because you're going to drive people away from the Lord not draw them towards him. As, as uh, the Lord says in Hosea, I draw by the bands of love, uh, not by the, the spear of, of force and hatred. Internal obedience to the movements and inspiration of the Spirit is another kind of Christian filial obedience, uh, filial uh, pertaining to being a son or daughter. So we're the adopted sons and daughters of God the Father by the merits of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. Faithfulness to one grace attracts other graces. So it is the same thing, cultivating virtues. The more virtues you cultivate, the more uh, you will cultivate other virtues, the more you'll, you'll expand. In that. Uh, to have one virtue is not a virtue, it's a vice. So uh, a virtue does not exist in a vacuum. It always needs other virtues. Now, now, of course, you might be weak in some virtues and strong in others, and uh, we really need to work on those virtues. But you cannot 
you know, reject all the virtues and say, I'm going to have one, and then that's that. No, it doesn't work that way. Love doesn't work that way. Faithfulness to one grace attracts other graces. Each time we obey an, a divine inspiration, our heart grows and becomes capable of receiving more. So it's by expanding our heart that we can fill our heart, that there's more of the heart to fill in grace. I also want to insist upon something that might be called obedience to life's events. This doesn't involve falling into fatalism, that, oh, that's, that's the way it is, que sera, sera, or passivity, but welcoming in trust the situations we encounter. So our relationship with grace is not passive. It's very active. It's very strong cooperation, which can only be done by the power of grace. We can only cooperate with grace by grace, by God's divine energy. So, but in welcoming and trust the situations we encounter, say, I trust you, Lord, that you're going to use this situation, which seems so bleak and so terrible. And uh, I turn everything over to you, and I repent of any ways that I'm blocking the movement of your grace. I repent of, of any of the hatreds or anything like that that I may have towards uh, people who, are, uh, who have uh, created these terrible situations. Uh, including ourselves, we have to forgive others, but we have to forgive ourselves also, in in, in, in involved in the, all of this. So into that, but there it's a I turn everything over to you for you to use, and I'm going to practice your presence even in the midst of all this. So, uh, but the one thing that God cannot use is my own unrepented sin. I have to repent of it. Of course, it, I'm talking about known and knowable sins, because sometimes people are just oblivious, invincibly ignorant when it comes to certain uh, issues or whatever, or just plain profoundly weak and such things. And so, but uh, God is there, and God is giving us the grace of repentance. And may, of all the graces, may that be the grace that we embrace first and most firmly. Because it's so crucial to saving faith. Welcoming and trust the situations we encounter. And the, it's like the prayer of, of Blessed Charles de Foucault, the, the prayer of abandonment. In the certainty that the providence of the Father will arrange for everything for our good. So everything. All things work together for the good for those who love God in, in, in Romans 9, St. Paul. This kind of obedience is centrally important. The more I accept the events of my life with confidence, the more I receive the grace of the Holy Spirit. So again, this is not fatalism. This is not predetermined, you know, say, oh, this is all predetermined. This is not uh, total passivity in the face of evil, in the face of other things. This is not, uh, not, uh, this is not spiritual or moral laziness, or even physical laziness. Uh, although sometimes the Lord just wants us to stop doing and start being in some things. Uh, uh, God does not want to work ourselves to death, us to work ourselves to death, uh, which is counterproductive, but to pace ourselves in the power of this grace, using our natural talents, our natural abilities, our natural strengths, and letting God use our natural inabilities, our... Uh, weaknesses, our uh, ineptitude for, to uh, use that, for, let him use that, because he will if we let him, but not to be uh, uh, lazy about it, say, oh, well, I can never do this. Well, you know, this stuff that you can't do, true, you know, you don't have the ability at all, for one thing, or the opportunity, but uh, but as G.K. Chesterton said, and I've quoted him before on this, anything worth doing is worth doing badly. So loving is worth doing, even if we're immature in it and all that, it's worth it. It's worth it. Well, of course, this, I'm talking about agape love here, all that. So even the, the pain that is involved, especially in the face of rejection. 
God doesn't permit something to happen without, at the same time, granting us the necessary grace to live it out in a positive way. So, you know, the, the, look at the martyrs a little bit. The, 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 their, uh, the injustices visit on them, the wickedness and the, 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 the cruelties and visited on them became channels of their greatest victory. And accepting it, I am welcoming the grace that comes with it. But of course, martyrdom should not be provoked. St. Augustine warned people about that. Because you may not have, you may have the presumption, because, but that may just be a presumption. You may cave in in a, in a situation which if you have avoided it, if you, you had been discreet, it, it, it wouldn't have happened. So... And sometimes it's just out of ego, you know, I want the world to say, oh, how courageous he is and all that. So, eh. In accepting it, I am welcoming the grace that comes with it. So every situation comes with a grace to deal with that situation. Every difficulty with the grace to deal with it. Every, every temptation with the grace to overcome it. Concerning... Consenting to all the various aspects of life is a fundamental receptivity to the spirit. So that, so uh, we are not Manichees, we don't have a split between the material and the spiritual, and we're not radical Jansenists. It's, if you enjoy it, there must be something really wrong with it, but we're not that. It was G.K. Chesedo or Valer Belloc who said, uh, uh, Wherever the Catholic light doth shine, there is dancing and fellowship and good fine wine. So, uh, that's it is. So, of course, drunkenness is condemned, that, including tipsiness is condemned. And that not just coming with wine or alcoholic beverages, but with any intoxicants at all. Uh, to that uh, drunkenness and, and the like are, are con uh, condemned. And, uh, and we see the bad fruits of it all the time. Consenting to all the various aspects of life is a fundamental receptivity to the spirit. Life takes on coherence and beauty when we accept it in its entirety. Eddie Hillesum, who is Jewish, I remind you, writes, this sort of feeling has been growing much stronger in me. A hint of eternity steals through my smallest daily activities and perceptions. I am not alone in my tiredness or sickness or fears, but at one with millions of others for many centuries. And it is all part of life. And yet life is beautiful and meaningful too. And so and she's putting this down during the period of persecution of Jewish people under the Nazis. And, uh, and I believe she herself is, will be killed uh, in this, that she couldn't get out of the situation, no matter how she tried. And um, that was that. And she never became a Christian, not in this life anyway, uh, but she was an anonymous Christian because that's, this is the work of grace. This is someone in grace. Uh, you know, the, the wisdom is, is the wisdom of, of, the, of the Lord that she's uh, showing for it. So it is meaningful even in its meaninglessness, provided one makes room in one's life for everything and accepts life as one individual whole. For then one becomes whole in oneself. But as soon as one tries to exclude certain parts of life, refusing to accept them and arrogantly opting for this and not that part of life, yes, then it does become meaningless. Because it is no longer a whole, and everything then becomes quite arbitrary. From Eddie Hillisum, Eddie, the letters and diaries of Eddie Hillisum, 1941-1943, edited by Klaus A. D. Schmelich, and translated by Arnold Pomeranz, published Grand Rapids, Michigan. William B. Erdman's 2002, page 466. That sounds like a book worth getting. 
Jesus refers to this form of obedience when speaking to Peter during his apparition on the shore of Lake Galilee after the resurrection. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you girded yourself and walked where you would. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish to go. Isn't that the truth? John 21, 18. These words apply to the martyrdom of Peter, but we can also understand them in a much more general way. Life sometimes leads us down paths we haven't chosen, but which we must consent to out of love. This consent then becomes a source of grace, a way of union with God, and an experience of the presence of the Holy Spirit, who comes to the aid of our weakness. In his first epistle, Peter expresses it in this way, but rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are a reproach for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. 1 Peter 4, 13, 14. We can understand these words very broadly. Each time we accept the conflicts and difficulties of life, with faith in Christ and for love of him, the Holy Spirit rests upon us. Again, this is an, uh, about passivity in this, or, or uh, fatalistic yielding, or spiritual or moral laziness. Five, practice of interior peace. If we want to be open to the grace of the Holy Spirit, we must struggle, insofar as it depends on us, to preserve our interior peace. It sounds like a, a contradiction. You struggle for peace, but you fight for peace. No, it isn't. Strive to preserve your heart in peace. Let no event of this world disturb it. Reflect that all must come to an end. Take neither great nor little notice of who is with or against you, and always try to please God. From St. John of the Cross, Sayings of Light and Love, 154-155, in the Collected Works of St. John of the Cross. I think it's Father Kavanaugh's uh, assemblage. Page 55 in the English translation. I have calmed and quieted my soul, says the Psalms. Psalm 131-2. The more our hearts are peaceful and untroubled, the more they can receive the movement, light, and help of the Holy Spirit. On the contrary, worry, agitation, and anxiety close us off from grace. In returning and rest shall you be saved. In quietness and in trust shall be your strength, says the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 30, 15. Keep this in mind. Only when we are in the state of peace do we have good discernment. So if I'm in total turmoil, it's going to be very difficult to make a good decision. So I have to get that inner peace, uh, which comes from tur just turning it all over to God. Say, I'm turning it over to you. Of course, this doesn't mean abandoning reasoning. And it's good to make you know uh, columns of the pros and cons for particular action or in, inaction uh, on, on something and doing that and praying about that and getting good advice from people you know who are solid and also who are uh, who can keep a, 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 a confidence. In returning and rest you shall be saved. Keep this in mind. Only when we are in the state of peace do we have good discernment. As St. Ignatius Loyola points that out. See clearly in the various situations that confront us and find the right remedies for our problems. Tempestuous time, periods of trouble and worry are bound to come. But our perception of reality is so distorted by negative emotions that we must wait for peace to return before changing any fundamental resolutions. Mechthild de Bar counseled one of her sisters, be faithful in keeping your interior peace. 
because once you've lost it, we don't see a thing. We don't know where we're going. From Kathleen de Bar. Nectilde was a religious name, I guess. Uh, écoute de Saint Benoit, uh, listening to Saint Benedict. But published by uh, in Rouen by the Benedictine du Saint Sacrement, nineteen seventy nine, page sixty five. Six. We're on page eighteen. Live in the present moment. That's the only moment you have. The past is gone. The future may never be. This moment is the moment I have. This is the moment of the presence of God. This is the gift God has given us. And as some wit once said, that's why it's called the present. Another important condition for receiving the Holy Spirit is to live in the present moment. The more we are in the present, neither looking back nor anticipating what is to come, although we should uh, do that carefully, Although sometimes we just, the, the, but we have to realize the past, we have to let go of it because it's gone. We can't undo the past. We can't correct the past. Only the present can we do. The future, the same. We can plan for the future. We can direct for the future, but we have to live in the present because the future may never happen. And something may come around and whatever that plan is, it may be uh, blasted to smithereens. But God is God. All things work together for the good for those who love God, from Romans 9. The more we are in touch with the real, with God, with interior resources that empower us to face up to living in the here and now, the more receptive we are to the work of grace. Sterile regrets, uh, especially uh, the bitter regrets, and... Uh, directed at ourselves and then directed at others to often the bitterness uh, becomes uh, consuming resentment and then we can't we can't move and it, it poisons everything so, so Jesus it wasn't for nothing that Jesus told us to forgive and how central that is and uh, but we have to resist the devil's quote unquote reasoning to, Oh, if you forgive, then you're condoning that. You're saying uh, it doesn't matter what this person did or what this person can, can do. So it doesn't mean you, you don't put your head in the mouth of a lion. You uh, don't do that. You don't uh, provoke that. You don't take a, a, a rattlesnake to your breast. Because then the rattlesnake bites you and you say, you bit me. I took you to my breast. Well, of course I bit you. I'm a rattlesnake. You don't do that to rattlesnakes. You let them go. Or you uh, uh, restrict them, shall we say? Uh, so, and that's true often with people in our lives. We have to do, you know, people who are going to draw us into sin, and we know it, and we know our weakness, and that person knows our weakness. Often, there are relationships we just have to keep at a distant, a polite level, and there are some that we just have to be just cut off altogether. And, uh, and then there are relationships that are difficult that we really need to keep up to some, in some way. That'll be draining, but we cannot permit ourselves to be just totally drained by other people, by the, those who are emotionally needy or, or manipulative or grasping. It's like in the uh, Sinbad the Sailor story. The uh, man who was the beggar who was supposed to have been crippled and in reality, he wasn't. He was, I think, a demon or something. And uh, so he carries him on his shoulders, uh, seated on his shoulders. So, so he has his legs around, but he just keeps, the beggar keeps, because the object is to strangle Sinbad. So uh, Sinbad has good motives in this, but uh, it's only going to have a bad end. So eventually he throws him off. So I can't remember how it ends. Uh, but uh, that, so we have to be careful about that. We have to uh, take care of ourselves as well as others. If I don't take care of myself, I'm not going to be able to take care of anybody else. And then there are people who, you know, with their mental illnesses or whatever, uh, just suck everything out. 
So we have to pace ourselves with them. We have to uh, defend ourselves. Uh, but we also are called to compassion and generosity in that. But uh, we were not called to foolhardiness or to sentimental uh, digging pits for ourselves to fall in. And then, of course, when we when we're collapsed, the other person just going to say, "Oh well," and then go off to someone else, and often blame us. Have you ever been uh, attacked by someone? You poured yourself out totally for that person, and then and you collapse practically. And the person not only is not grateful, not only is not compassionate, because often the problem, the psychological problems, make compassion very difficult for that person. Uh, the person blames you and t attacks you. And maybe defame you in the, the situation. So, so we and we have to say no to people's self destruction. As difficult as that is, so it, 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 rather than to cooperate in the self destruction out of uh, sentimental cares, or often it, to make ourselves feel good in this. Sometimes we should feel bad <laughs> about things, uh, and. That God is with us. Divine providence is with us. And it's and I am not the Messiah. You are not the Messiah. Jesus is the only Messiah. He is the Savior with a capital S. I am not Superman. I do not have a big red S on my chest. I am a weak uh, person uh, with uh, have, have, have had broken spiritual bones and other things. But God's strength can, can work through me. But it's God who's doing it. God not only has to get the glory, God has to do it. Because I can't. God can use my abilities, but he can also use my inabilities. And he can use my inabilities better if I turn them over to him than my abilities if I don't. Uh, uh, if I'm just, you know, in there with my own ego and say, no, I'll do this. Uh, God, okay, you, you, you uh, no, you don't need to bother. I, I'm going to get the gold in this. Thank you. No, God has to get the gold because he is the gold in this. Sterile regrets, rumination on the past, over and over, rumination going to be like the pig Go over and over and over. That you know, it swallows it. Is it a pig? Anyway, well, ruminants like cows and the like. They chew the cud and then they swallow it and then they bring it up and they chew it over again and over and over and over and over. That's often what we do with uh, things, uh, painful things in our life, or injustices, or like, or or different things, or uh, uh, insults and humiliations in our lives. We bring them up. And if you're of that personality, you know, and I'm like that, I, I remember every humiliation I've ever had. Do I remember every time I've been praised? No. But I remember every single humiliation from my earliest memories. Uh, and and every, everything that struck me at that time as in, unjust or whatever. I remember all that stuff. But I should not go back there. Because then you go back there and you churn yourself up. You're all churned up over something that happened a long time ago, maybe even over people who are long dead. And you said, oh, I should have said this. And then and this witty uh, little uh, dagger twist, I should have done that, or this and that and the other thing. And I should have said this and that and the other, and done this and that. And the other. But, you know, for the most part, I'm glad I kept my mouth shut in a lot of those situations. And, and I do regret having spoken up. But what can I do with that? So, I've made mistakes. I've made mistakes in assessing other people's actions. But I can't go back to that. I can't uh, uh, roll on the hot coals of, of, of regret. I have to move on. I have to go forward, trusting in the providence of God, trusting in the healing of God's grace, and trusting that I can be a channel of God's grace to these situations and into the past. I, to let God into the past, turn the past over to him, and let God do the healing in this. And the same with the future. I'm a, what if, what if this happens, what if that happens, type of person. 
And I said, no, that's not gonna, that's not helpful. How often Jesus tells us not to worry. Yeah, uh, have concern, but don't worry. Because even if I'm killed or whatever, that uh, it's all ultimately in the hands of God. If I let God have it, if I turn it over to him. And that's for my benefit, and it's for the benefit of the whole cosmos. It's not for God's benefit. Now, God doesn't need any of this. God doesn't need you. God doesn't need me. But God loves you and me infinitely. And Christ would have gone through the whole thing, the incarnation and everything involved in it, all the sufferings and struggles and all that stuff, the death on the cross, the resurrection, everything he went through, the whole bother of being, becoming fully human and being bodily and, and taking on mortality and all the struggles that's involved, all the pains. But he did that out of love. And if you or I were the only one who needed he would have gone through everything completely with as much dedication and as much love, his infinite love. And uh, the incarnation is the reason I believe in a personal God. If I didn't believe in the incarnation, I wouldn't believe in a personal God. Because, frankly, most people I know would be morally better than such God who would, couldn't be bothered to plunge himself into the mess. To say with Mighty Mouse, here I come to save the day. Uh, the only way he saves the day is not like Mighty Mouse, who just pulverizes the thing, but he plunges himself into it. He takes on the, what is not assumed is not healed. I believe it's St. Athanasius who said that. So uh, God took all this on himself, all of materiality, on himself in in taking on the fullness of humanity in taking on a body which is why having icons and stuff is very important the proclamations of this this and their uses of the material to praise and proclaim god so as i mentioned we're not uh manichees uh, i'm not manatees i'm not a manatee either although sometimes i feel like one but Manichees were people who said, there are two gods. There's a good God who is spiritual, and everything about him is spiritual, and anything material is not of him. Then there's the bad God who made the material and who imprisons us in materiality and, and everything to do with that, the emotions, all this stuff, all that. And uh, the physical, especially stuff we like. And all that and uh, you know everything from meat eating to wine drinking to anything yeah you know, keep yourself alive maybe just barely go the Jane extreme <clears throat> in some cases um, that's not Jane from Tarzan and Jane that's the Jane religion so there were extremes within there are uh, of the, the sky clad James who uh, believe that you should starve yourself to death but that's the ultimate freedom so, uh, no, thank you. No, no, no. The, the body is good. The body is to be cared for. The physical. I am this body. I am this soul, but I am this body. I read a book on the, Jeho uh, the, uh, the Hare Krishnas one time, and that was one of the, the maxims that this person was being taught by one of the Hare Krishnas. I am not this body, because you know, they believe in reincarnation and all of these things. These things. But uh, in this, it's spiritual that is real, a sat, that's real reality, that's uh, ultimately the uh, the uh, God, ultimately Brahman, Brahman, uh, the, the, the Atman, the, our personal godness or whatever, personal perfection, personal eternal, eternity. But we're not eternal, we're everlasting, our souls are everlasting, but they're not eternal. Only God's eternal. God's life is eternal. His grace is eternal. But we are not. But we are going to be everlasting. Our souls are immortal. And our bodies, too, will be immortal and transformed. And there will be that total unity that our mind tells us there really should be with body and soul, which there isn't at this point because of sin and all the other stuff, because of mortality. But we will overcome mortality in Christ, the risen one. We ourselves will be risen. Praise. Sterile regrets, rumination on the past, 
worries about the future, cut us off from divine grace. So we said, no, no, I don't need that grace, but I uh, did this. And, and, and sometimes we just, uh, we really like worrying sometimes. We just really get caught up in it. it. It makes us alive. It doesn't make us alive. It does the opposite. It sucks life from us. So, so I saw a, a post one time, it showed this puppy, uh, and it said, the puppy was, was, uh, uh, you know, uh, smiling and being attentive like a puppy and it said if all the others have lost their head and you've kept it you obviously don't know the seriousness of the situation but uh, uh, no we need to keep our heads panic does not help uh, the, the worry does not help uh, but it, that's easy to say and hard to do but God's grace helps us in that brings us on to all this. If we entrust the past to the mercy of God and trust the future to his providence, doing just what is required of us today, so much what is required of us today, yeah, plan for the future, don't procrastinate. Plan for the future, put the plans in God's hands. Don't say, oh, these are the plans, I want you to do this, I want you to bless this, and uh, no changes. Just do what I want. Because often, let's face it, rather than praying in the Our Father, let it be done to me, or, or, praying with Mary, let it be done to me according to your word, or praying in the Our Father, thy will be done. We often want my will be done in this. And my will and God's will are not always the same. And I need to grow in that discernment of what is God's will in this situation. Yes, I can make mistakes, I can make honest mistakes, I can make loving mistakes, but I need to pursue God's will rather than mine. My will is not what makes the world go round. My will is what usually messes up my little world. But see, it's the will of God, so turn that over. But also, we have to avoid the other extreme, saying, well, if it's my will, it must be wrong. That's not necessarily the case. If it's in accord with natural law, if it's good, then that, that my will may be an expression of divine law. So uh, we have to grow in discernment more and more and be willing to do that, willing to yield to grace in this, and willing to get up and move when we need. Now, when people say, oh, you should get over that right away. Well, uh, no person can tell you that. Only you can tell yourself when you're ready to move. But we have to move. We have to uh, move on. But we move on not away from what we love, but really moving towards what we love, because what is really good is all caught up in God. And then we'll have everything. Everything we invest in God is permanent. Everything we don't invest in God will pass away. Oh, and, and we, we, everything we don't invest in God will not only pass away, most likely it will... Uh, get in the way of everything it will become an obstruction but what's turned over to god that's uh, god heals and and brings to fulfillment maybe not in this life but in that but so there's the the faith is so much the trust trust in god's promises and all this i'm the resurrection and the life whoever has faith in me even if he dies shall live and whoever lives and has faith in me will never perish so we'll leave that we just so much the more we dispose ourselves to receive the grace we need day by day. So let's pray the Our Father together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So again, the announcement. 3.30, and before that, uh, the uh, uh, mid-afternoon prayer for the deceased, uh, the Mass online for Joan Pugh on Facebook at 3.30 in, the, in our little chapel here. And uh, so that's the announcement. So, and I said the Our Father. Did I give the blessing? May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
Amen. Alleluia. Maybe you got two blessings. Why not? Let's see if I can get out of this couch easier. There. And let's see. Someone gave a big message. Someone did. Let's see who's waving. Janet Driscoll, Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Julio Driscoll, Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. John and Judy Sheridan, Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. And this is uh, a message. Everything is grace. What a beautiful gift God gives us with grace. There we are. Barbara Black Lebembery, Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Amber Van Grant, Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Eunice Idiabonia, Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Bye now. God bless you. Because Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. We are surrounded by God's grace. We're surrounded by his providence. We're surrounded by his love. Even in our difficulties, he's there. So let's not give up. Let's not despair. And let's help each other in that. Because God has given us each other to support ourselves, to lift ourselves up to uh, that. So remember, relieve you all that game. Well, if it was just you... Someone could bowl you over, running over. But if you were all connected it, with, with your arms, you could uh, resist the person bumping into you there. Bye now.